Jeepers! Welcome to another episode of the Unmasked History of Scooby-Doo, the podcast where we delve into the mystery of Scooby-Doo media, getting clues from people who helped bring our favorite mystery-solving dog to life on various platforms, and maybe eating some Scooby snacks along the way. I'm your host, Alexa Lawler. Scooby-Doo, where are you? And it would have been mine if it hadn't been to those meddling kids. Gang, we've just been handed our next mystery. Blasted meddling kids. (laughs) This week on the podcast, we have Kate Melton who played the role of Daphne Blake in the 2009 and 2010 live-action TV films Scooby-Doo The Mystery Begins and Scooby-Doo Curse of the Lake Monster. I had a lot of fun chatting with Kate, and I hope you also have a lot of fun listening. Thanks for coming on the show today. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here today. So if you're up for it, I'd like to start with a three-question trivia game. Oh, gosh. Okay. Yeah. I like games, so let's let's do it. Question one, according to the Scooby-Doo Encyclopedia and other sources as well, how old is Daphne Blake? Oh, boy. This is See, this is where I get confused because, see, there's so many different, like, like versions like you know like all the movies I feel like so and obviously in our film I think she was 16 uh so I'm gonna go with like 16 that is correct yeah is it <laughs> it is oh good I was like I feel like in the you know in the theatrical ones she's older so like I don't know so that was just a good guess I guess all right I'm on a roll here yeah definitely it kind of changes all over the place but I think the general yeah, consensus is 16 okay all right Um, And question two, this might be a little bit more of a difficult one. Uh, What's the first thing that Daphne says to Shaggy in The Mystery Begins? Oh, okay. I know it's it's on the bus. Um, It's when he, okay, wait, I'm having, okay, he sits down next. I haven't watched this movie in years. He sits down next to her and he has his sandwich. It's like an egg salad sandwich or something, right? Uh, I don't know, like maybe what's that or something? What are you eating? Something like that? That does work, but technically the first thing that she says is, uh, sure, just let me move my backpack. Oh, so not even close. But I'm right, though. That's that's what what the situation is, right? He's, like, trying to sit next to her on the bus? Yeah, that is what comes next. (laughs) I'm a little rusty. (laughs) Okay, I was close. I was close-ish. Very close. Last question for the trivia game. In The Curse of the Lake Monster, uh, what is the name of the character who took the only known photo of the lake monster, which then proved to be a fake? Oh, okay, wait, I know this. I know this. Elmer Uggins. Yes, that is correct. <laughs> like, I know it has to be close to that. I'll never forget that name because I remember we just loved that name. We thought it was hilarious. Yes, that is correct. Yeah, that was, that's a, yes, that's right. Okay, yay. See, so like two out of three, not bad. Not bad at all. Um, And to start off the general questions, uh, what's your relationship to Scooby-Doo? Did you grow up watching? Yeah, I absolutely did. In fact, you know, when I got the audition for it, um, I remember thinking, wow, this would be so cool because I I dressed up as Daphne for Halloween when I was a kid. I grew up on it. I loved it. And I had seen up to that point, I'd pretty much seen every Scooby project that there had been. So I I had a very good relationship with it. I mean, I had, there's tons of pictures of me as a kid. I had like a bunch of Scooby-Doo t-shirts and stuff. Like I I was really into it. So when I got the audition, I just remember thinking how cool that would be for whoever got to do it to get to be a part of such a, you know, a franchise that is so loved by so many and has been for such a long time. And do you have a favorite uh, personal memory related to Scooby-Doo before you booked the project? Do I have? I mean, definitely when I booked the project, that sort of trumped all other memories, right? Um, definitely. But I remember that there was, I'm going to, you're you're probably the expert on this. So I'm probably going to butcher this. But there was one that was like ghoul school yeah, yeah or yeah. something. 
Right? Okay, I used to be obsessed with that when I was little. Like, I used to watch that, like, every single day. So that, you know, is, and I haven't seen it now in probably 20 years. I should really probably get on that. But I think that for me, like, those memories of, especially being home from school in the summer, I would always watch that. And I have some very fond memories of of watching that one. What was the audition process like for The Mystery Begins? It was really long. Um, So... Let's see. I was, I believe, probably 15 when I auditioned for it. And it was one of those projects that everybody in town was going out for. I mean, they cast a really, really uh, wide net for this one. I mean, I think that they auditioned everyone. And, you know, being an actor, like all of my friends were my same age, but they were all actors too. So literally everybody that I knew went out Um on this project, especially because there are four such distinct roles, right? There's kind of a type for everyone. And, you know, I got the audition and I went in and um, I believe that the cast and director, Harriet Greenspan, I I had known her for a while just because I'd been auditioning for such a long time. And, you know, I went in, I had the audition, it went really well. I think that I want to say that we did something close to maybe, I want to say I probably went on seven auditions for it. So it was the original audition and then callback after callback. And then, you know, I don't know how much you or your listeners know about the sort of the audition process and the way that these things work, but you go in for a couple of auditions with the casting director and then you go in and you meet the producer and the director. So eventually I went in front of, um, you know, uh, Brian Levant and Brian Gilbert, the producer and the director. And, and then eventually after you make it past the producers and the directors, then you have to go in front of the entire network and do what's called a screen test. Um, and a chemistry read. So when we got to that point, there was two groups. So there was two of each of us. There was two Daphnes, two Shaggies, two Freds, two Velmas. And it was, you know, that we were kind of all competing against each other. And then I remember being in the room with, uh, so what they do generally in a chemistry read and a screen test is they'll kind of mix and match people to see like has the best chemistry and who works best together. And uh, it was actually like our, my group was me, Robbie, Haley, and Nick. So it was the four of us from the very beginning. So it was like, I knew either we were all going to get it or, or we, you know, none of us were. And for some reason in that room, it just clicked. We did the, 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 the scene in the library where we're all at the table, like when we're in detention before the books start flying and stuff. And I mean, we just, it was weird. Like we all just sort of clicked and it was like the perfect fit. And, you know, I think I got the call a couple days later that that we got it. But yeah, I mean, it was, it was a couple of months worth of auditioning. It was quite a process. And every time I get called back, I'd be like, oh my gosh, again, like it's torture kind of like, it's exciting, but it's also, it's kind of tedious, uh, a tedious process because you just keep going back and back and back and wondering like is this the time they're going to tell me I got it no I got to go in again so it was it was pretty tedious and was there a point when you were pretty confident you were going to get it or were you always in the back of your mind thinking that you might not get it I mean I think that as an actor you kind of especially a young actor you kind of have to always have a a certain level of uh, skepticism and cynicism about it because you know, if you go into everything thinking you're going to get it, you're going to get your hopes. You're going to be destroyed so many times emotionally. And especially when you're as young as I was, like I always knew I would never, like, I think even when I got the call that I got it, even though I was excited, I think I remember just being like, okay, well, I'm not going to celebrate until I'm on set, you know, because you just never know and things can change. And, um, and, and there's so many different factors. So I feel like I thought that I would, but I, I had gotten really close on several other projects. Like I was really close on Wizards of Waverly Place. I was really close on Hannah Montana, actually. So I had been through this quite a few times, this process of going on like 10 auditions and screen testing and then not getting it for whatever reason. Um, so I think with this one, I was just, I was cautiously optimistic. I felt good about it, but I just try to, to stay grounded in it. And what was your reaction when you did get that call? You know, it's weird. I think because you have this, this vision of like jumping up and down, like screaming and you're so excited, but I feel like I was in shock because it was, it wasn't just any project, you know, it was Scooby-Doo and it felt from the very beginning, it felt like something really special. And, and I think at first, I don't think it really sit like actually sank in for me until I was on a plane to Vancouver with Nick Pilatus. I think that's when I was like, oh, wow, this is really, this is really happening. So obviously, you know, I was really excited. Everyone in my family celebrated. We were, you know, we we're so excited, but 
it definitely took a while for it to feel real just because it was such a big, you know, such a big job. And had you ever met uh, Nick, Robbie, or Haley before the screen test, or was that the first time you had met them? So Nick, I had met before. Nick and I had a lot of mutual friends, um, and you know he was he was older than he's a little bit older than me, so he was a little bit older. We didn't really hang out too much, but um, but we had met before, and I knew of him. Um, his little brother's Cameron is closer to my age. And then Haley, I had never met Robbie. I had never met, but we did meet, you know, we all met at the screen test and, um, and after we all booked it, we, we got together a couple times and we had like lunch. I think we went to like IHOP once just to kind of get to know each other. But for the most part of it, with the exception of Nick, um, the screen test was the first time I'd met, I'd met Nick and, or sorry, Haley and Robbie. And what was the dynamic between the four of you? I mean, I just feel like it was really good. I think that we all were really different um, and we all got along. I was the youngest, so I was the youngest and then it was Haley and then I think Robbie and then Nick. So um, I was 15, Haley was 17, and I think the boys were like 19 and 20. And so, you know, there was a little bit of an age difference there, but we all just, we had a really good time. We all got along super well. There was no drama and we all worked together really well. What's your favorite thing about the character of Daphne? The character of Daphne. Um, I really like that she, she's a little bit like me in that she was smart (laughs) like I'm like calling myself I'm like she's like me she's smart (laughs) um she's she she's really smart but she also you know has kind of a flair for the dramatics which I definitely have and I like that even though she you know was fashionable and pretty and all these things I like that she was still grounded and she was still really smart and I think that too often as women we kind of are told that we have to be one or the other and I think that she's a great character because she gets to be all of those things. And that was another thing that I really liked about the live action interpretation that we did was I feel like they gave Daphne more meat, if that makes sense. You know, she wasn't in the cartoon. Sometimes I feel like she's just kind of a pretty face and she's just there, but she, she was contributing, you know, she had things to contribute in this interpretation. And I feel like that gave girls a really good, role model to look up to of like, oh, I can be pretty and fashionable and all these things, but I can also be smart and helpful and, um, and a good problem solver. And she, she had her own way of doing things, but she got the job done, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And I I really admired that about her. And what did you want to bring to your interpretation of her? I think I just wanted to make her feel three-dimensional or, you know, I wanted to make her feel like a real person as opposed to, like I said, the cartoon, which was just you know, she, she wasn't the main focus of the cartoon and she wasn't the main focus of our film either, but I think it was really important for, you know, Nick, Haley, Robbie, and myself to, to bring a little bit of like our own personalities into it. So, you know, I tried to give, I gave Daphne a little bit more of like an attitude, you know, she was a little bit sassier at times. And, um, I just really didn't want her to be the quote unquote stereotypical, like, you know, ditzy, pretty girl. Um, I, I really wanted her to have some depth and, and I think that, I think I accomplished that. I just, I, I wanted, I, and I also didn't want to, you know, go in and copy anything that like Sarah Michelle Geller had done because I think Sarah Michelle Geller did a wonderful job, but I, I thought it was really important. And I know that the whole cast felt that it was important that we sort of set our interpretations apart and, um, and just have fun with it. And I, I think we did that. And what is it like to try and bring such an iconic cartoon character to life in live action? You know, I would say that it's it it's difficult just for the fact that because it is Scooby-Doo, there's going to be so many critics out there, you know, so many people that no matter what I did or no matter what anybody else did, they were going to have something to say. The Scooby-Doo loyalists, as I call them. Um, so it was it was a lot of pressure in that sense. But the great thing was that we had an amazing director, Brian Levant, who, you know, encouraged us to just go with our guts and and said, you know, there's a reason you guys got these roles, you're perfect for them. And we want you to just go for it. And 
you know, he really encouraged us if we had ideas of, oh, this would be funny or like, you know, little things we wanted to add, he, little improvisations. He was very open to that. And I think that that took a lot of the pressure off of us. And so I, I would say there was a lot of pressure, but I felt just so lucky and so honored to get to do that, especially with a franchise that I, like I said earlier, that I grew up with and loved. I just felt like that was such an honor that they chose me to do that. And after both of those movies came out, had you ever had kids come up to you recognizing you as Daphne? You know, I think, um, yes, I definitely had that happen to me a few times. But also, you know, after the movies were done, uh, after the first one, I was back to my blonde hair, you know, we dyed my hair red, and then I was back to blonde. And I think that I look very, I don't know, I for some reason, when I would have blonde hair, people just didn't, didn't really pick up on it. Although it was funny, you know, several years after the movie, the movies had been released, I want to say 2017 or 18, maybe I had a girl come up to me at Universal Studios, Hollywood of all places. And she was like, this is crazy, but you look just like this girl from this movie from Scooby-Doo, Cursed Lake Monster, Kate. And I was like, yeah, that's me. But it was just so funny that like all these years later, people are still recognizing me or even, you know, I get a lot of people that find me on social media and they're very confused and they're like, wait, is this you? I'm like, yes, it's me. So I definitely had people recognize me back then, but I mean, even to this day, I I still get, occasionally I'll get people or, or I'll get, you know, people that track me down on social media and want to say, want to know like, Hey, you look like this. Is this you? Yes, it's me. (laughs) So it definitely, it's actually amazing to me how many people are still so invested in these films. What's that experience like having people recognize you? Weird, but I mean, I think as an actor, that's kind of what you, you know, that's part of it. That's part of what you sign up for and and part of what you want. So I just have always felt, you know, flattered by it and, and lucky that I've been able to have any sort of impact on anybody's life in a positive way that I've, you know, I've had people tell me that, the films help them through a certain point in their life or, you know, or that Daphne inspired them or that I was a big part of their childhood. And I just, I just feel honestly, I feel so honored by that. And I feel so lucky that, that I've been able to be a part of so many people's lives in that way. So anytime anybody recognizes me or recognizes me, I always just feel grateful. And going a bit off the hair here, you are naturally a blonde. Was there ever any discussion as to whether you would dye your hair or maybe wear a wig? No, I think from the very beginning, it was, and I, I mean, I had said to them and they asked me, would you be willing to dye your hair? And I was like, of course I would be willing to dye my hair, you know, for this, for this role, of course. Um, and then, no, I mean, I think the, if anything, the first movie, my hair was more of a, like a strawberry blonde. It wasn't really that traditional, like cartoony red. Um, and then by the second movie, I remember having a conversation with them and just being like, listen, if we're going to do it, let's just do it. Let's just go full red. Um, and then so that to me is like the classic Daphne hair, the Daphne from the second film, uh, the hair from that film. And I had the most amazing hair dresser on that film. Her name is Ramona Fleetwood. She's worked on everything in the world. And uh, it was it was quite a chore to keep up that hair. I mean, I would have to stay like everyone else would go home at midnight and I would be in the hair trailer until 3 a.m. getting my hair touched up once a week. Oh my goodness. To keep up that continuity, you know, because if my hair's super red, red hair fades a lot and really easily. And so to keep up that continuity, you know, of, of, okay, well, my hair was this red in the scene prior. So we had to keep it up. It was, it was crazy. It was, it was a lot of, a lot of time spent on that hair. I'll say that. And what was the atmosphere like on set? Oh my gosh, so fun. I mean, it, it was, both sets were just two of the most fun experiences I've ever had working in this industry. Everyone was just so nice and so happy to be there. And, you know, we were working with, with people that, uh, like, for example, in the second film, our director of photography is Dean Cundy, who was the director of photography on like Back to the Future and so many huge films. So we were surrounded by people that, really knew what they were doing and were were such inspirations to us as actors and Robbie Haley Nick and I we really loved each other we hung out you know especially when we were in Vancouver we would hang out on the weekends and it was just such a pleasant experience there was it was honestly just no drama 
and I can tell you right now, there's not a lot of sets um, that it's just totally drama free, <laughs> but ours really was one. And I think we all just had a genuine love for each other and for the project. And who would you say you got closest with on your time on set? I would say Nick. Um, Nick and I, you know, have, have stayed really close and um, he's just a great guy. I mean, every, they're, they're, you know, everyone is, is awesome, but I, I would say Nick and I bonded the most for sure. And out of both movies or one for each, do you have a favorite scene? Oh, wow. Um, out of both movies, I would say my favorite scene is probably the scene in the second film where Fred and Daphne are in the boat and they get trapped and the monster like breaks the valve or whatever. So the room starts to fill up in, with water. Uh, just because I thought it looked so cool and it was such a nightmare filming that scene that when I saw it and it looked really good, I was just so happy because, uh, you know, we were in a tank, a water tank pumped full of water and the water was so warm and it was like being, you know, that feeling when you're like in a hot tub for too long and you feel like you're going to pass out. It was that. And we were in there for like probably two hours. Oh my gosh. And there were light bulbs were exploding where they shouldn't have been. And so it was such a nightmare <laughs> that, that to see it and see how cool it looked and how well it came together was really, really cool. And I think that's just a great scene. The character of Daphne is often known for, you know, being a bit of a fashionista. Uh, mm -hmm. What's your favorite outfit that Daphne wears in either of the movies? Oh, wow. I definitely like the fashion, the Daphne fashion a little bit more in the second one. I think it's a little bit more grown up. Um, I love that just iconic, like purple turtleneck dress that I wore. I think I, I think I wear it in the beginning of the second film. Um, it's like a purple turtleneck. It's for when she's arri when they're arriving at the country club and all that. I love that one. And I also, you know, in the second film, we did the music video, <laughs> musical number portions of the movie and the costumes for those were so cool. Like the disco costume and, you know, the barbershop quartet outfit with the mustaches, and <laughs> the, um, like the sixties music. I, I loved all those costumes as well. We got to wear really fun stuff for that. Out of those costumes, do you have a favorite? I really love uh, the I Can Be Scared With You, the six like the 60s outfit when I'm playing the tambourine. I love that outfit. It's so fun. Um, <laughs> I obviously don't know how to play the tambourine either. If you watch that, I'm like not even, it doesn't, I, it's like, I don't even know how to find a beat. It's so embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But Haley's a, Haley's a real drummer, so that was really her playing the drums, which you can tell, actually. I mean, you know, she looked really good, but oh, boy. Yeah, I did not. I was, I, I took me in. They're like, Katie, you have to find the beat. That's how this works. I'm like, oh, yeah. And did you get any input when it came to the wardrobe at all? Um, I think, you know, in, on most sets, it's, well, I don't know. I can't speak for most sets, but I think on a lot of sets, it is a little bit of a collaborative process. So I know that at the end of the day, the final say went to the director, Brian, but I definitely in my wardrobe fittings would kind of be like, I don't like that, or I do like that, you know, and the things that I would gravitate towards and feel the most comfortable in, because you want your actors to feel comfortable in their wardrobe, you know, it's their character and their they're the ones that are up there and for the whole world to see. So you definitely want them to feel comfortable. And so, you know, I think that, like I said, at the end of the day, Brian got final say, but I definitely think the wardrobe department allowed me to sort of say to them, oh, I like this, or I don't like that. And then the things that I really liked and felt comfortable with, because they trusted me as an actor and they knew that I was in touch with my character, they would sort of try to push those things a little bit. So I think that I would say, yeah, I would say I got a fair amount of input on it. I would say maybe probably more so the second one because everybody, the characters were developed and we were also comfortable in them at that point. But I think that they really, you know, listened to me a lot on that one. And after filming ended for either of the movies, did you get to keep anything from set or a wardrobe piece or anything? Do I have any? No, I, you know, I don't have any wardrobe pieces just because you know, they, they are not usually very willing to let you do that because they take all of the props, all of the wardrobe pieces and stuff. They take them back to the warehouse and they store them in case, you know, we ever needed to do reshoots or, or something like that. But I do have, you know, I have certain things like I have my 
my chair back that says Kate Melton. It has the mystery machine. It's signed by everybody. I, I have certain like little things. There's a little, uh, what is that cartoon dog? Huckle, Huckleberry. There, there's a bobblehead in the mystery machine of another Hanna-Barbera character. And my parents have that. Okay. So, I mean, we do have like little things here and there, but as far as wardrobe pieces, no, I don't have any wardrobe pieces, unfortunately. I wish that I did. Oh, actually, wait, I do have my scuba gear from the second one. Like I have my flippers. <laughs> okay. And like my scuba mask from when we, when we scuba dived, but I think that's about it. Awesome. Um, and moving more specifically to The Mystery Begins here, uh, what was it like to be able to film an origin story for Scooby-Doo? It was awesome. I mean, it was so cool because it, had, it hadn't really been done at that point. And, you know, in fact, I'm so protective of it that now when new, you know, like Scoob just came out, for example, and I'm like, that's not right. That's not the origin story. We already did it, you know? Like, I, I'm so protective of it because I just, at that time, it felt so special and it felt so cool that we were going to get to tell that story first. And it still does. I still, I'm just going to forever consider our origin story the real origin story. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was just, I can't say enough about how much that franchise has meant to me over my life and how much getting to bring an iconic character to life, you know, especially telling the origin story of how they all got together, how much that, that meant. I mean, there are films that people have done and people will do that are popular, but they're not part of a, um, a legacy in the way that Scooby-Doo is. And I, I just, I can't express enough how awesome that was. And out of the more out there crazy scenes, like the the fight on the bus, the library books flying off the shelves and like just running mm -hmm. from ghosts in general, which one was the most difficult to film? The most difficult to film? Let me think about this for a second. This is a good question. Um, the library books was really fun because, I mean, I say it was fun. It's fun looking back. In the moment, it probably wasn't that fun because there were literally just crew members throwing books at us. In fact, I think my mom actually got in on it too and was actually throwing books with the crew members. <laughs> so, which I'm sure she loved. Um, but I'm going to say the most difficult scene to film, not even technically, but the scene where we go in the first film to the graveyard and Velma does the the um, the rubbing of the of the gravestone. That was probably the most difficult to film only for the fact that it was like, two o'clock in the morning and we could not keep it together like the four of us could not stop laughing and they had I don't know why I think we were just tired and we were just you know like whatever I think Nick had a line and it just cracked us all up and I mean we must have done 40 takes of that scene and you know Brian Levan's like you guys need to get it together and we just like couldn't stop laughing we were just oh, dying man. during that scene and I think it was just, we were just all tired and we were all so comfortable with each other. So that was, that was, that was difficult for that reason. That's the only time in my career that I just haven't been able to get through a scene because <laughs> I just, I couldn't keep it together. None of us could. <laughs> and which was the most fun to film? Which was the most fun to film? I, out of both films? Sure. Yeah. The party was really fun. The party in the second film um, where we you know the, the late monster shows up to the party and uh Robbie gets like thrown across the room that one was really fun um also because we had like Nichelle Nichols on set that day I don't know if you know if you're familiar with Nichelle Nichols but uh she was in the original Star Trek so she we were all like really big fans of her and so that was a cool day what else did we love filming I liked oh I loved filming the scene where uh Shaggy eats the napkin <laughs> in the second film just because it was so fun to watch Nick eat that like Mars Capone napkin over and over and over um what I mean it was I really enjoyed watching I didn't do very many stunts which is or any really at all which is probably for the best because I'm not very coordinated um but I really enjoyed being on set and watching the boys get to film those scenes I, I was fascinated by Robbie and Nick and their ability to do their own stunts and I thought that, that was really cool also another great scene was the scene where we unmask uh Velma as the witch or as the you know um 
what is I forget the witch's name, but when we Wanda, it's Wanda. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you know, she knows. I love <laughs> it. Um. Yeah. When we and that, that was really fun and and. Uh, I just can't think of a single day on those projects that I wasn't just so excited to go to work or that I didn't have an awesome time. I mean, it's so hard to kind of pinpoint what was the most fun because overall it was just such an enriching and awesome experience. And every single day was just the time of my life. And going off of Nichelle Nichols, there was a lot of really cool people playing supporting characters in the two movies. Who was your favorite to work with? Well, I'm going to have to go with Jonathan Winters because he is such, and actually, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't actually even know that his scenes made it into the final cut of Scooby-Doo Cursed Lake Monster. Um, But he plays the owner of the barn that we burned down. And I mean, are you familiar with Jonathan Winters at all? Yes, yeah. I mean, just a legend. And that was so cool. And his... He was just ad-libbing. He was totally going off book and he was just cracking us all up and it was hilarious. I mean, he was just such a legend and and sadly, you know, he has passed, but it was so cool to be in the presence of somebody that has had such a huge, I mean, I think even Robin Williams said that Jonathan Winters was like his biggest inspiration and um, being around him was just so cool. And I think he passed not too long after. And then Marion Ross, that was really cool. She's the, um, she was the mom on happy days. You know, she's worked a lot. Nichelle Nichols. It was just so, it was so cool. Like as young actors to be surrounded by these veterans of the industry that have been in it for so long. And like, we just, we just were in awe of them and it was, it was so cool. And they were so kind to us and would give us advice and um it was a dream. I I still to this day like I just can't believe how many awesome people we got for that for those films. And I think a lot of it is is credit is due to Brian Levant because Brian Levant's been in this industry for a really long time and he's known a lot of these people for a long time and he's worked with them. So he was able to get to get us quite a few really special, you know, guest stars. Unfortunately, I'm not sure if those Jonathan Winter scenes actually make it into the film. I don't think that they did. I don't think that they did. I know that some of the gags are on the um, gag reel, um, which I believe, like the, the the blooper reel, which I believe is um, is on the DVD extras. But yeah, unfortunately, I think it was just a time thing. I think they had to cut them for time. It's always unfortunate when that happens. I know. We need like an extended cut or something. An extended, extended cut with yes, all extended, the music extended. videos added in. Yes. Oh my gosh, those music videos. Oy, oy, oy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, for The Mystery Begins, what's it like for the filming process when it comes to like CG things that might be added in later? You know, we had people uh, kind of cueing us. So while we didn't exactly know what the ghosts were going to look like. I mean, we'd seen storyboards, so we had like an idea, but I mean, that's part of being an actor, you know, you just have to sort of use your imagination. And it was weird getting the hang of like the ghosts and Scooby and kind of getting the hang of, of knowing where Scooby is and the right height of Scooby and how to interact with him. I mean, uh, Nick definitely had it a lot harder than us in that respect, Um, But I think once we got the hang of it, and like I said, you know, we had Brian Levant, who is such a uh, veteran in the industry. And I don't know that the movies would have been half as good as they are if it had not been for him kind of walking us through it, because none of us had really done anything like that up until that point. And so, you know, we would have him, you know, trying to scare us like the ghosts would and showing us where they would be. And we just had to kind of react to them. And it got a little bit easier when we got to the second film because when we got to the second film, then we had um, Luke Youngblood who was in the Scooby out, like a Scooby green screen, like suit type thing and would walk around on all fours (laughs) and, and do, you know, he had like mocap sensors and he would do the, the faces and the, you know, the, the dialogue and kind of react for us. And that definitely made it a lot easier. But I feel like by the second one, we were kind of like pros at it already because we had, you know, been through that already. Definitely. Um, and so when you go down into the old school underground, that was actually like real spiders and snakes, wasn't it? 
Yes, it was. Yes, yes, it was. I had a, a, a like a tarantula on my shoulder and this, the trainer, you know, because whenever you work with um, animals, like even a frog, you know, like how we had frogs in the second movie or a spider, there are people there making sure that all of those spiders or all of those frogs get back, you, you know, make it out of set safely. In fact, if you, you know, let's say you're filming with 10 spiders and you lose one, you can no longer put at the end of the movie, no animals were harmed during the making of this film. Oh, okay. Which is a big deal. So, you know, but I, I just remember the spider person, the spider handler being like, okay, we're going to put this spider on your shoulder, but just whatever you do, like, don't blow on the spider. Like, just don't put air on the spider, you know, try to, okay, like, you'll be fine. Spider's not going to just don't blow on it. I'm like, okay. So we're standing there, you know, and we're doing, and then Brian and Vance like, somebody blow on the spider. We got to get the spider to move. Somebody blow on the, so they have a straw and they're like blowing the spider. To get the, I'm like, the spider's going to attack me. Um, oh my gosh. It was, it, it was one of the, one of the more frightening experiences that I've had on the set just because I'm not, I'm not a spider gal, let me tell you. Um, and then actually when we did Mist, or when we did Curse Lake Monster, we had all those little baby frogs um and we lost one like we couldn't find it it got away and they had to shut down set for like two hours to find this frog oh my goodness did they find it they found it they found it but this is why people say they don't want to work with children or animals (laughs) because it's like it's crazy and so at the end of the film you have the recreation of the scooby-doo opening what was it like to shoot that that was so cool. We were so excited about that. And that was all the brainchild of Brian Levant, again, who is such a Scooby-Doo loyalist and is, you know, wanted, really wanted to, to kind of give a nod to that. And, you know, it was cool. We had all the classic villains, you know, from the original opening, like the voodoo guy and the clown. And, um, and again, I think anytime we were doing something that was a nod to the original, we were so happy. Like that is what we all really wanted to do. And I think it turned out great. I mean, Brian, like I said, I've said it a million times. I'll say it a million more. Brian Lohman is a genius. Moving more specifically to the lake monster, uh, how much of a break did you have between wrapping The Mystery Begins and starting on Lake Monster? I think about probably about a year because we didn't start until after uh mystery begins aired because I I they already had the script but we didn't if if my memory serves me correctly we didn't actually get the green light to go ahead and and do um Cursed Lake Monster until after the network and Warner Brothers and everybody saw how successful the first one was because you know to this well I, I believe to this day uh mystery begins is still the number one rated broadcast in the history of Cartoon Network I believe it's still to this day. So once they saw that and they realized what a success that it was, I think that's when they went ahead and gave us the green light. And actually we were supposed to be a, a, we were going to be a television show. Okay. At one point it was uh, considered a, what they call a backdoor pilot, which just means that they're kind of testing the format of a show um, to see if it would work as a show and they do it as a film. So we were going to go on and we were going to do a season of a television show. um, But what ended up happening is that the CGI was too expensive and the network didn't want to do it. Fair enough. Which is a shame because it would have been a great show, I think. People loved, I mean, people would have loved it. And um, so, yeah, I would say we had about a year's break because I want to say I was probably about 15 when we wrapped Mystery Begins and then 16 by the time it aired. And then I don't think we started on Curse Lake Monster until I was about 17. You mentioned that you didn't really do a lot of stunts, but when Daphne falls out of the barn, was that actually you? (laughs) That was me. And it was, that's probably why they don't have me do my own stunts. Um, Because because it was hard being on a harness like that. Like you think it's going to be easy, but it's hard. And I got to be honest, I don't have a whole lot of like core strength at that point in my life, I guess. So, you know, you're strapped to this, um, this harness and then you have to kind of keep your legs up to make it look real. Um, and then, you know, of course, Robbie caught me, but that was me. That was my one and only stunt was falling out of that (laughs) barn. And (laughs) it was, it was something else. Although I could consider playing tennis a stunt because, uh, I, didn't have any idea how to play tennis. I mean, they asked me, they're like, can you play tennis? I'm like, yeah, sure. I can play tennis. Like how hard can it be? 
No, I could not hit a ball to save my life. It took them forever. There's videos of Brian Levant out on the court, like trying to show me how to hit a tennis ball. Because Daphne is supposed to be like a good tennis player. And I was the worst. I look, it looked like I, I'm just like the least athletic person alive. And, um, <laughs> oh man, that's why I think if you watch the movie, you'll notice they never actually get me on camera hitting a ball. Cause I couldn't. <laughs> I think you actually might. Do I like just barely maybe, but like it was, it was a process. And I just remember Robbie just would like sit there and just laugh and laugh and laugh at me when I was trying to hit those balls. It was, oh man, that was, that was one of the more embarrassing days of my life, actually. (laughs) Um, And so that barn moment really kicks off the romance that's kind of played up in Lake Monster with Daphne and Fred. What was it like to, um, act out act that out with Robbie I mean it was it was weird I guess just because we were friends and um you know there was sort of a brother sister dynamic there and um you know but I think everyone knew that that's kind of what the fans wanted to see you know they wanted to see the Fred and Daphne like dynamic but it was fun to do the scenes you know where they kind of start fighting and there's sort of like the jealousy issues and stuff like that that was cool um you know, Robbie's a super good actor. He's a super good dude. So he's, he's super respectful. And, um, and I always felt very comfortable and I think that he did too. And it was just, you know, just, just another day of work. And what are your thoughts about the Fred Daphne romance in the franchise? Do you think it's, uh, totally a thing? I mean, yeah, I do. In fact, I didn't know how they were going to, there was a lot of discussions about um, because we were supposed to do a third film and there was a lot of discussion about what they were going to do. Were they going to have that be a thing again? Were they not going to, you know, was that going to kind of be us addressing it and then we were going to squash it. So, but I mean, I think that there's always that kind of that chemistry between them. I think that's an undisputable part of it. The thing that was weirder to me was the, the shaggy Velma romance. Yeah. Definitely. (laughs) That was where I was like, this is weird. The Fred and Daphne thing felt just kind of natural, but I mean, I don't think we'd ever seen a Velma Shaggy type romance ever before. So that to me was, was weirder, not, not weird in a bad way, but like weirder than the Fred and Daphne thing. It was like, what? Cause I mean, I think everybody expects Fred and Daphne to be a, a pair, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I think that that's what, that's, that's what people wanted to see and I think that the Altair brothers who wrote both scripts were really interested in giving them in, in giving the fans what they wanted to see and I'm so they they wrote an amazing script for the third film and I'm just so sad that it never happened what was the plot supposed to be like for that so um obviously it's been a long time since I read it but I'll do my best to kind of summarize uh, essentially what it was going to be was that it was going to take place in um Europe like London, I believe. And it was a time travel okay. movie. So we were going to uh, time travel. And at one point, I think that Daphne was supposed to end up as like a druid sacrifice. Interesting. And they were going to save me. I mean, it was going to be really, really cool. And I think too, that there's been um, the Altier brothers, I think, did an interview where they kind of elaborated on it. But it was going to be so fun. I was going to get to ride a horse, which I was big into horseback riding at that point. So I was going to get to ride horses in it. And it was going to be awesome. I'm so sad that they didn't end up doing it. And I think the reason they didn't end up doing it is just because, I mean, it was weird because, the, you know, like I said, Cursed Lake Monster, or sorry, Mystery Begins was the, the highest rated broadcast in Cartoon Network history at that point. And then when Curse Lake Monster came out, that was now the second highest rated broadcast in the network history at that point. And the division of Warner Brothers that um, co-produced the film, Warner Premiere, they just sort of started to fall apart. And the people that, I believe it was the people that owned Scooby or something, they just, they didn't want us to do it. And it just became a whole mess. But everybody was, we were ready. I mean, we had a table read, the whole cast got together. We read the script, like we were ready to, you know, start working on it. And then at the last minute, it just kind of fell apart. But it's a shame because it was going to be a really, really good 
movie. I have the script somewhere. We were going to go to Eastern Europe and film it. So we were all really excited about that. So it's just a real, just a real shame. Now you and I think Nick as well aren't as involved in acting anymore. But if uh, the chance came to uh, maybe reboot that, would you do it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. I, you know, I've been an actor since I was 11. So for me, I just, wanted to kind of take a step back and and work on the other side of the industry for a bit but I am an acting teacher I'm an acting coach so that is my number one love in life I love acting I would always 100% if they ever called me I mean I'm a, I think I've probably aged out of it a bit now but if they if they called me and they wanted to reboot it I would yeah I would be there in a heartbeat for sure And moving back to Lake Monster what were your thoughts when you first read the script especially with the Velma storyline I mean, I loved that script. I Curse, Curse Lake Monster is my favorite out of the two. And I, I I thought that script was hilarious. I thought it was different, which I, you know, liked. That was obviously a huge twist that it would be Velma. Um, it, you know, I, I think we were all really excited about it. It gave us a lot more room to play and, um, and do a lot, a lot more than we got to in the first one. And there was more classic Scooby gags in the script. I felt like, like, you know, when they're running from the frog monster and he paints like a tunnel on a wall, stuff like that. Like we, we got to do, we got to do one of my favorite things was the classic uh, gag where we're running down the hall and then we go in one door and then we come out the next door and then we go in another door. You know what I mean? And so th- like, um, that was something we really, we really loved about that script was I felt like there were so many more classic because also we had a much bigger budget and uh, we were able to do a lot more. So I just, I loved that script. I, the Altier brothers are phenomenal writers and I think that they did such an amazing job bringing these characters to life for us. What was the filming process for like running through the doors? (sighs) You know, my gosh, I'm getting old. My mind is, I would say that it was, exhausting because I listen I told you I'm not very athletic the other thing I'm not great at is running okay I (laughs) literally had to the the medic every set every film set has a medic on set in case somebody hurts themselves right that medic was by my side like nonstop because I would always the other thing is they would put me in heels you know and then they would be like okay Kate like run up this hill and I'd be like what I I'm wearing like three inch four inch heels what do you mean run up the hill Oh my god. So it was just a lot of me being stressed out trying not to fall on my face is what I remember about those cuz I just am not super coordinated. I'm just not. In fact, in there there's one part of the music video section where we're all like holding hands and we're like skipping down a hill or something. If you watch that, you will notice that I'm staring at my feet. <laughs> Because I'm on a grassy hill, like with wearing like boot, like die high boots, and I was gonna fall down at any moment. So if you watch that, you'll notice that I'm literally just staring down at my feet the whole time. <laughs> oh man! And uh, g- going off of that, what were your first thoughts when you heard that there were going to be musical numbers in that film? We all had the same reaction, and that reaction was what? I'm not a singer, okay? I'm not. I will just be really honest with you. I can carry a tune but like not very far and um neither can Robbie (laughs) (laughs) obviously Haley can right and um and uh Nick you know I think that the the song was a little high for Nick's voice but I won't get into that here (laughs) um Nick and I have had this conversation though I love you Nick if you're listening but um you know that was not in the original script that was something that Brian Levant came to us with like a week before we started filming and was like, guess what? We're like, what? He's like, I've added musical numbers. And we were like, what? Like, I was just like, excuse me. And so much of it, again, I'm not athletic. If you pay attention in the skating scenes, I'm not in those scenes because I cannot skate. Like the roller disco, I'm not in those. And actually they built me a, a little machine where they dressed me up and then they put me, <laughs> this is so embarrassing. They put me <laughs> on this like, this like rotating, it was almost like a merry-go-round. And they had me like stand like I was doing like a pirouette, you know, like with my leg up and then they spun me around and then they shot me from the waist up so it would look like I was spinning. 
and it looked so bad they didn't they didn't use it oh my goodness <laughs> so I mean I think we were all just like Oh, I don't know. We were really surprised by it. I was not expecting it. I just remember there being a lot of like confusion. Um, uh, it was totally sprung on us out of nowhere, which honestly, I'm glad that it wasn't uh, in the first film because I probably wouldn't have gotten the role. Because <laughs> <laughs> like, I just wasn't, I, you know, I think I did okay, but I was not, it took a lot of rehearsal for me to get it. What was the process like when it came to putting together all those various musical numbers? We had a choreographer um, that came and worked with us. We rehearsed for like, I want to say we were rehearsed for probably about a week before, like before we started filming, we would meet up at like a dance studio uh, near our production office and we would rehearse the choreography and stuff. Um, But I just remember Nick and Haley being super into it and Robbie and I just both being like, what in the world is going on? Like, what are we doing? (laughs) Like, I that's my memory. And then when we had to go and and uh record the actual vocals because that's us singing back up I just remember just feeling like I was gonna pass out from the stress I was so so nervous about it and if you watch like some of the behind the stuff uh scene stuff of us filming the not filming but recording the vocals like me and Robbie just look like we're mortified what was it like to have to go into the recording studio to do that I mean, it was really cool just because the composer um, that worked with us, uh, his name is uh, David Newman. And he, I mean, he did the score for the animated film Anastasia. He did Matilda. He did, like, he has, he's won many, 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 many awards. And so he's like a big deal. And so that was cool. We actually went to his house. Um, in Malibu and that's where his recording studio was and we were surrounded by you know I think he has an academy award I mean we were surrounded by his his various uh, awards and so that was really cool his cousin I think is Randy Newman okay Randy Newman so it was I mean it was just cool like I said we got the experience of working with some of the coolest people that I can imagine like I said I always say Dean Cundy our director of photography um who I believe even did Jaws, like he's done everything. Uh, And then, and then David Newman, which which was a big deal. And it was, I mean, it was fun. That's the thing. We always had fun, whatever it was that we were doing. We all generally really enjoyed each other and we had a good time. So it was fun for that reason. But I do definitely remember that I was very nervous, and very uncomfortable. (laughs) And do you have a favorite out of those musical numbers? Because there's quite a few of them. Yeah. It really are. Um, I'm like having like stress flashbacks. Um, I really, you know, I liked the By the Light of the Silvery Moon one where we went through all the different like genres of, of music. I thought those were really cool. And I love Nick and Haley's performance on that as well. Was the rap always part of it or was that added in a little bit later? <laughs> the, rap. the rap, I forgot it. Sorry, I forgot about the rap. Um, <laughs> no, that was, no, that was added in when he added in uh, the musical number. I'm sorry. I just am remembering this rap and I'm having like a flashback. Oh, uh, what fun. Yeah. No, that was added in when he added in, when he told us like, you know, there's going to be this and this and we're going to do this. And then also you're going to rap. We're like, <laughs> what? We're going to what? He's like, yeah, you're going to rap. We're just like, oh my gosh. Um, But yeah, the rap. Good stuff, man. Oh, now I gotta rewatch these movies. Definitely. I think, I think they still hold up really, really well. I do too. I, I, I think the last time I watched, I haven't seen Mystery Begins in a long time, but I think I watched Curse of the Lake Monster when I first met my husband. I think, you know, he was like, wait, you were in what? And I was like, yeah. And he like, was like, let's watch it. And I was like, okay. Um, and even you know even then I I feel like they they really did hold up and I feel like that there's a reason that I mean listen I get messages on a daily basis from people saying you know we love you or we love the the movies and this and that and I I'm always surprised I'm like really still but it really has had a lasting effect on people and you're right it, they they really do hold up so well still because we are coming on 10 years for Lake Monster this year. 
and then Mystery Begins 10 years was last year. Uh, what is it like to, you know, still have people messaging you about those movies 10 years later? Like I said, I'm always just like shocked, kind of. And I, it's, I would say in the last couple of years, it's gotten even more, I've gotten it more so. And I feel really lucky. I, I you know, I, I don't think there's a lot of actors that can say, that they've done a movie or, or a series of movies that 10 years later are still so popular. Um, and so I feel really, you know, like I said earlier, I just feel really lucky and really blessed. And I'm so happy that people still respond to it so much. And it, it was such a awesome time in my life. And I'm still so proud of it to this day. I mean, the fact that people still love it and still message me from all over the world. I mean, I get messages from all over the world, Brazil, China, um, you know, Canada, every, like everywhere. And it's just, it's really cool. It's a cool feeling. And why do you think that Scooby has been so popular for over 50 years now? You know, I just think that, that, it, I mean, let's see. I, I think that Scooby-Doo itself, I think that there is somebody for everybody to relate to. You know, I think that you can either relate to Daphne or you can relate to Fred or maybe you can relate to Shaggy or maybe you can relate to Scooby or Velma. I mean, there's there's a little piece of each of us in all, in those characters and there's a little piece of those characters in each of us, even if it's a combination of two characters that you relate to. But I think everybody has someone that they can relate to. And then, I mean, who doesn't love an adorable talking dog with a speech impediment? I mean, seriously, like who doesn't love that? And, you know, I think it's the same kind of the same concept as like crime shows are really popular. And I think that's because people love a good mystery and they love a whodunit. And so to take that format of a crime show and, and you know, these mysteries and then put it together with these awesome characters, like who wouldn't who wouldn't love that? And I also think that you've got generations of people that grew up with it. Right. And now we're going on 50 years. So people that grew up with it, that then introduced it to their children because it was a piece of their childhood and then they loved it. And then they brought it, they introduced it to their kids. So I think it's very much because it's been around so much. It's just a very generational thing. And I think, you know, I know that when I have kids, I'm definitely going to, you know, want them to watch Scooby and I'm going to introduce them to that. So I think that you just have grandparents that introduced it to the parents and the parents introduced it to the kids and and it's just really stood the test of time in that way and I think also they've been very smart about the way that they've constantly reinvented him and reinvented Scooby and you know done an origin story and then they did this and and they it hasn't become stale yet because they've constantly kind of reinvented it you know definitely and I wanted to chat about your coaching a little bit. Yeah. Um, so had that been something that you had always wanted to do or did you stumble upon a love for it? You know, I, I kind of just fell into it. I sort of decided I wanted to try something else and kind of take a break from the process of auditioning. It's, it's kind of a tedious process. And so I started working in casting. I actually started working for the casting director that cast Scooby, actually. And I started working with her and I really liked casting, but it wasn't quite what I wanted to do. And then I ended up working at um, an acting studio here in Los Angeles uh, with primarily young actors. And I just realized that it was something I was really good at. And I think part of that comes from my, you know, obviously my years of experience as a young actor. I think when you have a, an acting coach that is able to kind of relate and walk you through kind of like the unique challenges that young actors face. I think that that's a really good perspective to have. And so I ended up leaving the studio that I was at and I branched out um, at the beginning of 2019 and I created Kate Melton Coaching. And it's beyond my wildest dreams. I feel so lucky every single day that I get to wake up and do what I do. And I love my young actors so much. I work with kids from the age of uh, seven to about, I think my oldest right now is about 22. And I I love it. And I am, I just happen to be really good at it. And my kids are booking left and right. I mean, I, I just feel so lucky that I get to kind of be there to like walk them through the process and also to help the parents because it's, it's, it's kind of a scary industry for a kid, you know? And what's your favorite part about getting to work with young people? 
I love that I have all of this information in my brain of like years of training that I did and years of learning and years of experience. I love that I get to pass that on to somebody and it's just not like sitting in my brain driving me crazy. Like I'm happy that I get to pass that on. And there's something that I just love about working with young people where they're so much more resilient than we are as adults. And they're so much more open to criticism than we are. And I feel like we should all try. I learn from them every single day. I I try to learn to not take myself so seriously. And I try to learn to be brave because these young actors, like they're putting themselves out there. Sorry, they're putting themselves out there every single day. And they're so brave to be doing that. And even though I used to do that as well, I, I feel like as we grow up, we just kind of tend to put up walls and try to protect ourselves because we've gotten a glimpse of the real world. And they remind me that not everything is so serious and that it's okay sometimes to just have a good time and um, step back and, and be a little bit more vulnerable. And I think that that's a super valuable thing to be around every day. I think that covers all of the questions that I had for you. Is there anything else that you wanted to add at all that I maybe didn't ask you about Scooby, about coaching, about anything at all? No, I would just like to say something to the to the fans out there, if I could really quickly. Yeah, of course. I just want to say, and to you too, Alexa, you know, I really appreciate you contacting me. And just to anyone out there that the movies have meant anything to, I just want to say how much I appreciate you guys, um, how much I know that Nick, Robbie, and Haley appreciate you guys. And, you know, just thank you for always being so kind to us and and kind of bringing us into your homes and allowing us to be part of your families and your childhoods. And, you know, we love you guys. And I'm, I'm so happy that this film has stood the test of time and means so much to so many people. It just, it makes me so happy. And yeah, I just, I love you guys. And the fans love you too. Yay. Oh, it's gonna make me all teary. (laughs) Just before we end here, do you have anything that you'd like to promote or social media channels where people can get in contact with you? Yeah, I would say that, you know, I do, especially with the state of the world right now and what we're dealing with, I I do a lot of uh, Zoom coaching, Zoom teaching. I'm working right now on some Zoom ongoing group classes. So if anyone is interested out there in coaching, you guys can find me at Kate Melton Coaching on Instagram or katemeltoncoaching.com. Um, you know, feel free to reach out and um, I'm always around. So I'm always happy to, I'm usually pretty good at responding to fans. So perfect. Um, well, I think that covers everything. Thanks so much for coming on the show today, Kate. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure. Anytime you guys, anytime you want to have me back, you just let me know. I'll be here. And that concludes today's episode. Thanks again to Kate Melton for taking the time out to be on the show. For more groovy content, be sure to check at Unmasked SD on Twitter at Unmasked SD Podcast on Instagram, or at UnmaskedSDPodcast.com. If you like this episode and want to hear more, also make sure to check those social media channels or the website. Or you can listen to older episodes wherever you like to get your podcast fix. And if you want to follow Kate, you can find her on Instagram at Kate Melton Coaching. Thanks for listening, and keep an ear out for the next episode. Scooby-dooby-doo!